Good morning. Today I will be sharing on worship that is pleasing to the Lord. Last week I had spoken about worship and divine alignment in our lives. <clears throat> and today I will be sharing about four things um, about us having an understanding uh, about how worship can be and is to be pleasing unto the Lord. And before I do that, I want to share uh, two things about worship that is not pleasing to the Lord, worship that would be false, worship that uh, the Lord would not accept, not approve of. And um, uh, firstly, let's understand what is, what, is, what is this false worship. There is worship that is pleasing to God. We know that in scripture. And we also know from scripture, there is worship that is not pleasing to God. In scripture, we see examples of it. You know, in the very first book of Genesis, we see the example of Cain and Abel. And though it is in the context of an offering that is presented to God, we still see that it is worshiped. It is an act of worship. And uh, we see that God disapproved of the offering that Cain brought and he approved and he was pleased by the offering that Abel brought. And uh, that resulted in what we can, we can say would, would be the first worship war. Uh, and as a result of that, Cain murdered his brother Abel. I mean, this is serious what we're talking about. Um, I, I believe that every battle and every war uh, on the face of the earth that has ever happened and is happening and will ever happen till this earth remains is connected directly or indirectly to who or what people worship. It's all about the battle for worship. And so what we're talking about is not merely theoretical. It will shape your life. It will determine a, your eternal destiny, beloved, who you worship and how you worship. And so we see examples of that in scripture where <clears throat> there were, uh, you know, acts of worship that God uh, approved of and there were uh, on other places that he disapproved of. We see an example, fast forward in the, in the Gospels, when Jesus gives the story of two men who come into the temple to pray. And as they were praying, we see that one is a Pharisee, the other is a tax collector. And the Pharisee, appealed to his self-righteousness. He, he positioned himself before God, that God, uh, I am not like that tax collector. He actually pointed to the tax collector and said, God, I'm not like him. You know, I'm a good man. I fast, I tithe, I do these, these, these things. And therefore I have earned my, my position before you. On the other hand, Jesus said that the tax collector could barely lift up his head before the Lord. And as he kept his head down, he beat his chest and he asked God to have mercy on him, uh, a sinner. And Jesus asked the question to the crowds, which of the two do you think was heard by the father and which of the two went home justified? And uh, the answer today we know is that it was the tax collector. And so what we see is that there are attitudes, there are postures, uh, there are actions that God approves of. And on the other hand, there are the opposite of them. There are certain kinds of attitude, gestures, postures, acts that God does not approve of. But both of them, interestingly, are, are acts of worship. They are religious acts. They are spiritual acts. So we have to go deeper. And we thank God for the light of his word and the power of the Holy Spirit that throws light into the deepest parts uh, of our being and that we would not fall into the guilt of uh, superficiality, we would not fall in the gift of self-righteousness, uh, of self-grandeur, of false religion, but that our lives would be simple, our lives, our offerings would be uh, acceptable to the Lord, and he would approve of what we would offer unto him, beginning with our lives and whatever our hands would bring to him in brokenness and humility. You see, my brothers and sisters, many Christians are, uh, you know, maybe guilty or are guilty not for worshiping 
false gods, but for worshiping the true God falsely. And let me elaborate on that. And you see that <clears throat> this was one of the main reasons for the Lord's disappointment and anger towards the people of Israel as recorded in the Old Testament. We see that in the book of Isaiah, chapter 29 and verse 13. In the book of Isaiah 29, 13, the Lord said, because this people approaches me with their words, honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. And their reverence for me consists of the commandment of men that is taught. Now, there are some serious things that the Lord, you know, is stating over here. So he's not just saying that <clears throat> I, I disapprove of these people. He just, just, just make a line. He gives the reasons for it. He says it's because uh, these people are coming to me with their words. There is, there is words involved. Uh, there, you know, there are probably acts involved. But in actuality, their heart is far away from me. And lastly, their reverence of me consists of the commandment of men that is taught. That means they are elevating what people are asking of them or expecting of them higher than what I have commanded them. Now, what can this mean? Let's understand this better. It means people do lip service to God, but in actuality, we spend their lives, you know, they spend their lives, their time, their strength, their finances to pursue things apart from God, to find their joy and their satisfaction uh, in those things. They superficially try to appease, not please, but appease God by outward actions of, of, of religiosity, like songs or you know, a portion of their finances and Sunday service, this sort of a religious checklist uh, that they keep for the week or for the month. Um, and, and, you know, get that ticked off and they feel they've done their bit for God and they try to appease him. They try to pacify, um, if I may say, divine retribution. And so it's in actuality, it's just lip service to God. And, and God obviously can see that. He's an all-knowing, all-seeing, all-hearing God. So, you know, God cannot be fooled. God cannot be mocked. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the last Sunday, you know, how a person spends their time and money are the clearest revealers of the deepest motivations, affections, and desires of their heart. In other words, what do they really worship? So what a person worships, what you worship is what you pursue with the core and the best of their life. So... You know, what is it that they are really spending their life, their real core, their energy, their affections? What are they employing those things for? Uh, you know, is, it reveals what they really worship. So it's possible that they are actually pursuing something else apart from God. And God and faith is like a small side dish. And they give the leftovers to God. And, and such Christians probably want church or religion to entertain them rather than be actually part of church as a community of disciples who are motivating each other by their sincere love for God and for people. You know, they, they, the way they look at church, you know, people who make God their side dish, you know, uh, have a very carnal relationship and carnal expectation from church. You know, they actually try to make the past and the church feel obligated that, hey, if you don't meet my expectations, I'm hopping on to another church, uh, you know, or I'm, I'm, I'm signing out of the Sunday service, you know, I'm, I'm getting bored uh, because you're not really, you know, um, kind of appeasing me, you know, you know, I'm not really getting hooked onto, uh, I'm not really getting convinced by what is being dished out. And uh, rather than, you know, wanting to sincerely, humbly, and joyously be part of a community who's saying, we want to know Jesus. We want to know God. We want to become like Jesus. And we want to make Jesus known together, you know, that this, I cannot be sitting on the fence. I've got to be part of this, 
you know, shoulder to shoulder. I've got to get into the chemistry of relationships and, and be vulnerable and be open and be sincere. Yes, we're all imperfect, but we will help one another to know Jesus and to become like Jesus and, and make Jesus known. That's not what their motivation is. So people who are tripping on, on false worship and, um, you know, they actually have made God their side dish. They, they try to do lip service to God. And, uh, you know, they try to do, they try to have a probably a religious checklist, but their actual substance of their life is being spent on, on something else, you know, whether it's just entertaining themselves or, you know, just pursuing their, idolizing their career, they've idolized their career, they've idolized finances, or they've idolized this good life that they're pursuing. And, uh, and therefore, church has to fit into that good life. So it has, church has to be entertaining along with all the other entertainments in their life, you know. And if church begins to confront that, then, oops, uh, you know, we want to hop out and we want to join another cool church. Uh, and then after about a year or two years, they realize that the grass is not greener on the other side. The grass is only greener where you water it. And so if you're not willing to plow deep and, and, and water and manure, your spiritual life, no one's going to do it for you. And after some time, you're going to get disillusioned uh, with the faith and you're going to get disillusioned with yourself. Um, that's, that's one part of false worship. I, I also want to highlight a second thing about false worship before we go into worship that is pleasing to the Lord. But a second aspect of false worship, and because I, and the reason I'm saying, talk, going to talk about this is because this, in the last few years, there's been such an upsurge of Christian music even in the Indian church context, you know? And uh, I, I want to say this very clearly. I come from a background ministry where um, uh, I've been um, a worship leader. I love worshiping the Lord with music. And music is one of the very, very sacred, very personal expressions of my love and my devotion to God. It's the way I I pour out my joy, I pour out my affection, my love for the Lord, I pour out my pain to him. And it's very, very personal and deep for me. And uh, I've had the joy of being a worship leader and all these years, you know, in our church. Uh, I was ordained as a worship leader in our church 97 of June. Yeah, 97 of June. And um, I, I, I gave that up in 2011 when I was requested and ordained to be a pastor of this church. So, I, I, but at the same time, I've also been watching and hearing what's been happening uh, around. I've got friends who are worship leaders and songwriters, uh, you know, friends that I've known for over 20 years, some of them. And yeah, and the good old, uh, the good new, sorry, good new social media and, and YouTube and all that's happening. And I want to say something for your good and for your benefit, uh, my brothers and sisters. Don't do the mistake of thinking worship is equal to music. Music is surely one of the beautiful biblical expressions of worship, but it is wrong and even immature uh, understanding to say worship is music. It's much deeper and wider than music and songs. It includes music and songs, but worship is far more deeper of, uh, and far more wider than that. And, um, and I, yeah, here's, here's the point I want to make in this, in this section. And one can be uh, listening to and singing all kinds of worship music, but not living a worshipful life. For example, King Saul liked David's music, but he rejected the word of the Lord that came through the prophet Samuel. We cannot grow spiritually if we want to be entertainers or be entertained by using Christian or worship music, but reject the word of the Lord. And, and so for those of you who binge on Christian music and you, you know, you all listen to Christian music, you upload Christian music, uh, you know, you're all over social media with worship music being in your background. Uh, I, I want to say this to you. It proves nothing. It proves nothing if, our lives are not worshipful. What we post on social media or what we're listening to YouTube proves nothing, my brothers and sisters. Uh, but how we actually live our lives in secret before God, how we live our lives when no one's watching, 
that's that's determines how worshipful we are and how much of how much is god's worth and value in our life so let's now move straight into jambi to worship that truly pleases uh the lord i love this and uh, been wanting to share this uh for quite some time and i i believe that you will be encouraged blessed iron sharpens iron so be it so what kind of worship is true and pleasing to the lord well um god, god has not kept that as a secret he's revealed that in his word he's revealed that in 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 clear truths in scripture he's revealed that through the lives of people who have demonstrated true worship and so there's so much we can read about and find out oh this pleases the lord and therefore the opposite of it would not please the lord or there are places where god clearly rebuked a certain person or a group of people or a certain act and reveal that that i didn't approve of and and so we know and so we we need to be educated in god's word to know uh what kind of worship is true and pleasing to the lord so this is not an exhaustive list but i i this take this as an introduction take this as you know a few steps to get started and then pursue it further with your with your bible study so here we go number 1 worship that is gospel founded and gospel centered is pleasing to god you know and 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 i say this very clearly because if if a person is not born again by the gospel then that that is just religion it it is it is worship that comes forth from a a born again life a life a person who has heard the gospel repented of his is his or her sin turned away from 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 their self turned away from sin turned away from idolatry turned away turned their backs onto the world and turned to Jesus and and so their lives are gospel founded and gospel centered they are plunged into the in themselves into the gospel that that worship that comes out of that transformed life is pleasing to god and i believe that every born again child of god has a song in their heart it's got nothing to do with your ability to sing but you you have a you have a song of gratitude you have you have a thank you you, you know to jesus for who for what he's done for you and so being truly gospel centered will make us glory of god centered i always believe that a true and a proper growing understanding of the gospel will always keep us glory centered the glory of god not of self if somebody is still self centered they have not yet understood the gospel because the gospel is 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 clearly about turning away from self turning away from sin turning away from the world turning away away from idolatry and turning to the true and the living god the god who loved us so much that he gave his only begotten son not whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life so worship that is gospel founded and gospel centered is pleasing to god think about it and it's a sincere loving relationship with the lord evidenced by a love that seeks to please the lord that's what the gospel does it puts us in a real living loving relationship with the lord and 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 what is the evidence of it that someone who's truly born again he wants to please the father he wants to please jesus he wants to obey the holy spirit he wants to be led by the holy spirit and this is longing and this desire and that's the clearest evidence uh that you are born again and and that kind of a life and worship that comes out of that kind of a heart and life is pleasing to the lord amen to that number 2 or b is worship that is that is full of gratitude that comes from a grateful heart is pleasing um to the lord you know well, when we, when we go back to the old testament we remember the tabernacle and you know when we remember the tabernacle or the temple you know that when a person would come in the first thing that the person would would see is a gory sight and it would be the place where the animals were sacrificed and their blood was shed um on the base of which they could enter in and present themselves and their offerings to god and so every true worshipper every worshipper in israel knew that i can enter the presence of god because an innocent animal's blood has been shed every true child of god knows this that i can approach 
the holy God, the God of the universe, the God who created everything seen and unseen, is because the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, shed his blood for me. It is impossible to come into the presence of a holy God without remembering and without acknowledging the blood that was shed. Hebrews chapter 10. Therefore, we have boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. That's what the writer of Hebrews says. Clearly, we have boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Hebrews chapter 10. And so, we, 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 can, we cannot come any other way but by the way of gratitude. And, and that is just the beginning because as we enter in, we, we enter into the gates and we enter into his courts with praise and, and we, we remember all that God has done for us. We remember all that he has done for us even before we, you know, we spoke his name. Um, you know, one of the things I do every, every year, almost every year, is I rehearse uh, my entire life before God. And I recollect what he's done for me from my birth, from my childhood, uh, my growing years as a teenager, and how I began to get messed up, and then how he saved me at the right time at the age of 15, and how he saved me, oh man, how he saved me and then how he changed my life. And I rehearse all those years from 93 and I go through it, you know, and it, it obviously takes hours because I take time to go through it. I, I acknowledge my failures. I even uh, visit, you know, those places where I was hurt by others. And I, I once again give forgiveness and I offer forgiveness to people. And I go through that and I come till the present day. I, I recollect how I met my Farah and our family, my Anaya. I thank God for our church. I remember my leaders who have been there before me. And I rehearse the goodness of God. Every time I see how unfaithful I've been, how imperfect I've been, how sinful I've been. But I remember that my God has been good to me. And it's impossible, my brothers and sisters, you know, to, to come into the presence of God with, without a grateful heart. And I want to I encourage you that that's the kind of worship that pleases God, that rehearses his goodness, that rehearses his faithfulness. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good and his mercy endures forever. What would we do if it was not for his mercy? What would we do if it was not for his grace? What we would do if he was not faithful, if he didn't let, if because he didn't let go of our hand. What would have happened if he had let go of our hand? But he will never do that. And so it's so important for us, beloved, to rehearse the goodness of God. You know, I'm reminded of Psalm 50, verse 23. It's a beautiful psalm. I want to read that for you. Psalm 50, verse 23. And <clears throat> it's sort of connected to what I shared with you the last time. He who offers a sacrifice of thanksgiving honors me. And to him who orders his way aright, I will show the salvation of God. He who offers a sacrifice of thanksgiving honors me. And to him who orders his way aright, I will show the salvation of God. I believe there's an inseparable connection between thanksgiving and our lives being set in order. You know, somehow thanksgiving helps us to set our, our lives right before God, you know. Our thinking gets corrected, our, our heart attitude, firstly, our heart attitude gets corrected, you know. Um, God hates pride. He detests pride. But he is near to who the humble, the brokenhearted, and, and, and gratitude keeps us there. It helps us to cultivate a heart of gratitude. And, uh, you know, when we when we begin to express our gratitude, our gratefulness to God, it's a powerful thing. And our hearts get corrected. 
our mind gets healed, our minds get corrected, we, we get a sound mind. And we begin to see things clearly. We begin to see things rightly. We're able to set our lives in order. You know, ingratitude, a lack of gratitude, a lack of thankfulness just messes up our hearts and our lives, just messes up our minds. And, you know, I want to encourage you to be grateful. Let your worship be full of gratitude. You know, let it be from a grateful heart. So the first thing I shared was that worship that is gospel-founded and gospel-centered is pleasing to God. Number two is worship that is filled with gratitude is pleasing to God. Number three, sacrifice of praise. Oh, yes. Hebrews 13, 15 to 16. Let me read that for you. It says, through him then, let's continually offer a sacrifice of praise to God that the fruit of lips praising his name and do not neglect doing good and sharing for with such sacrifices God is pleased. So there are just two things over here. Through him then, let's continually offer a sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of lips praising his name. So there is verbal praise. There's verbal praise, song, or just saying it aloud. And do not neglect doing good and sharing for and sharing for with such sacrifices, God is pleased. So not just verbal, but use your hands. Use do what, what God has given you. Share it with others. And uh, the Bible says with both such sacrifices, God is pleased. This is an inseparable connection. I want to talk about that even in the next point. But when does something become a sacrifice? When it costs you, right? If it didn't cost you, it is not a sacrifice. <laughs> it, it, you're giving something that you don't need. That's not a sacrifice. So sacrifice is when it costs you something, when it's expensive. I, I love the attitude of David when he, uh, you know, once in, in a time of a plague, that was a judgment from God upon him and upon the nation. And he had to go to a particular piece of land and, and make an offering and make a sacrifice over there. And, and when the owner of the land saw King David coming, he said, I'll give it to you for free, O king. And this is what King David re responded to that man. He said, I will not offer unto the Lord anything uh, that does not cost me. And wow, that's the attitude of a worshiper. You know, does it cost you to praise God? Does it cost you to worship God? You say, Shan, you know, how, how can I um, make my praise verbal, sacrificial? Praise God, especially when it's difficult to praise, when it's hurting, when, you, when you're going through pain, when you're going through suffering. That's when your praise is even more uh, pleasing to God. Well, you must praise Him in the good times. And thank him. In fact, if you don't learn to praise him and thank him in fair weather, a fair chance that you will praise him in bad weather. So praise him at all times. You know, as the old song went, right, which we learn in school, praise him, praise him, praise him in the morning, praise him in the noon time, praise him, praise him, praise him when the sun goes down, praise him at all times, praise him in every season of the soul. Uh, praise him when things are going well. Praise him when you're being blessed, you're enjoying, and the sun is shining bright in you, as Matt Redmond wrote. But praise him on the road that is marked with suffering. Praise him when he's giving. Praise him when he's taking. So exalting God when it's difficult, when you cannot understand what's the situation in and around your life, you know, that, that's precious to God. So suffering will reveal your faith and the content of your life. So when you're going through a tough time, um, praise God, praise God. I want to bring us to the next uh, point, which is connected to what I shared in, in this third point, and that is ministering to the poor. You know, we, we normally don't talk about this, and I really want to emphasize this, that ministering to the poor is a very precious act of worship. Ministering, this is very dear and important to the heart of the Lord. It's what I, it's, it's, what scripture calls the precious five. I know I call the precious five, five from scripture. The fatherless, the orphans, the widows, the poor, and the oppressed. These are the five. The fatherless, the
the orphans, the widows, the poor, and the oppressed. These are repeatedly mentioned in scripture. And I get really concerned when I see that there is a general apathy that you know, so-called Christians have towards these precious five. And look at what James says in James 1.27. Look at what he, what he has written. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God. You can say worship. Instead of using the word religion, you can use the word worship. Worship that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Wow. But the next one is even more so, so powerful. Proverbs 19, 17. Whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will repay him for the deed, for his deed. Whoever is generous to the poor, now just think about this is this is crazy. Who is generous to the poor lends to the Lord and he will repay him for his deed. God says, when you give to the poor, when you give to the poor, I become your debtor. You have lent to me. I mean, God could not be more clearer than this as to how important it is. You know, as we take as, as worship, we never looked at worship like this, right? We always... And, I, and I, we always looked at worship so much with respect to songs and music, but this is what worship is, beloved, what we're talking about over here. You know, Jesus, if, if you remember, Jesus actually said that in Matthew, in the Gospel of Matthew, if I'm not wrong, it's Matthew 25, where Jesus said, and as much as you did to the least of these, these as in as much as you did to the least of these, you visited in prison, you clothed the naked, you fed, you fed the hungry, you, you know, as much as you minister to the poor and the oppressed, you did it unto me. I mean, it was, it was almost like Jesus saying that you clothed me, you fed me. I mean, talk of intimacy in worship. This is intimacy in worship, beloved. Yes, we experience that in the mystical experience of worship song and praise. I do that. I believe in that. But equally mystical is the action of ministering to the poor and the needy. When was the last time? you were able to do that, that you were able to help the needy. You reached out to someone who was, who was in pain, who was in suffering. You know, the Bible says, better to go to the house of mourning than the house of mirth and celebration. Beloved, when was the last time you reached out to the hurting? When was the last time you reached out to the broken? When was the last time you shared with those who, are, who, who have been in need and, and want? Because Jesus says that as much as you did to, did to them, you did it unto me. Beloved, I want to encourage and emphasize this ministering to the poor. Very, very important worship that is pleasing to God. I, I want to say the last thing and, and then we'll close. And that is worship that is pleasing to God is when, when we do things in secret. And I want to confront and expose and call out, you know, the social media culture. You know, so, so many Christians have fallen into the trap because they've got psyched out by the enemy to put on social media things that Jesus explicitly warned should be in private, should be done in secret. When you pray, you pray in secret, my friend. When you give, you give in secret. When you fast, you do it in secret. There are things about you and your family that should be in secret. Why has the world, why have you allowed the world to tutor you as to how to live? That you've been, you've taken the risk of losing your reward eternally. Don't allow the devil to psych you <clears throat> by what you're seeing on social media. Look at what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 to 30. I'm going to read that quickly, but I'm going to read that clearly. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. 
But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. Beloved, let us not be in this position before the Lord on that day. Let us not lose our reward. Let us store up for ourselves treasures in heaven. And one of the most important way we do that is that we do it in secret. Whenever you're tempted to post something on Facebook or whenever you feel like posting, I'm not saying it is wrong to post things on Facebook or on social media or on Instagram or whatever, but you have to be sure why you're doing it. Ask a simple question. Lord, is this okay? Is this approved of you? I wonder how much of social media would remain if every true disciple of Jesus, every Christian would ask this question, Lord, should I be posting this? What is the purpose of this? What is the intent of this? What is the benefit of it? How will it bless others? What are you trying to show? And I believe it that if you don't keep a check, then you will end up posting things and making people aware of things that will cause you to lose your reward before God. Worship that is pleasing to God is is when, is when it is done in secret. When the Father sees in secret, three times Jesus said, when you pray, when you give, when you share, when you fast, when you worship, when, you, when you're serving, and no one knows and no one sees, but the Father sees, and my Father's proud of you, it's pleasing to the Lord, and you will have your reward on that day. So I want to encourage you, beloved, be Worship that is done in secret is pleasing unto the Lord. So four things I've shared with you till now. Number one, worship that pleases God is that which is gospel-founded and gospel-centered. B, that worship that is full of gratitude is, is pleasing unto the Lord. C, worship that is, you know, coming from a place of a sacrifice, sacrifice is costing you, that is pleasing to God. And worship that is not just verbal, but it is in action, especially to the precious five, the fatherless, the orphans, the widows, the poor and oppressed. You're sharing to them. You're giving to them. You know, that is pleasing unto the Lord. And fifth, I also shared about, you know, worship that is done in secret. When you pray and fast and give in secret. You know, I can share a few more, but we don't have time. Uh, you know, maybe on another day, I will talk about how being faithful in your family is, is worship unto God. Being faithful in your work as unto the Lord, not as I serve as trying to please men, but as unto God, that is pleasing unto the Lord. So my dear brothers and sisters, overall, all in all, I want to say this, that worship is pursuing a life of loving obedience to the Lord. Because he first and, in, and, and, and always loves you infinitely. I repeat that. Worship is pursuing a life of loving obedience to the Lord. Because he first and always loves you infinitely. No one loves you like the Lord. No one loves you like how he does. And one day he will, he will take you into his eternal joy. And till then let us continue to look to Jesus every day for strength, for wisdom, for his peace, you know, find your joy in him and be faithful to him right up to the end. And great will be your reward and great will be your joy when one day when you see the Lord face to face. Live to hear well done from him. God bless you. Have a worshipful week. Amen.